Who dunks M&M's? Who dunks M&M's? In chocolate, take a guess. In chocolate, can you guess? Who covers them in candy? So there is no chocolate mess. Who dunks M&M's? Who dunks M&M's? In chocolate, can you guess? In chocolate, can you guess? Who covers them in candy? So there is no chocolate mess. The M&M's man. The M&M's man. The M&M's man. And he adds a lot of love to make it all taste good. The popular M&M's candy has a pretty straightforward history and have been met with little controversy. They're a consumer product, mass-produced for the large market by a large company, and people are okay with that. But that being said, there was a time when people were concerned Ooh. that the red M&M was going to kill them. Ooh, that's dark. Forrest Mars moved to England in 1932 after arguing with his father, Frank Mars, founder of the Mars Candy Company, over disagreements in expanding the company to Europe. While he was there, Smarties were introduced by Roundtrees of York in 1937. He became familiar with the sight of seeing British soldiers eating the small chocolate drops coated in a hard pan candy shell as part of their rations. The Mars Company usually saw a drop in chocolate sales during the summer months due to the hot temperatures and chocolate's low melting point. So to Forrest, this was a revelation. Forrest returned to the US in 1940 and formed a partnership with Bruce Murray. Bruce was the son of William Murray, the president of the Hershey Company, and this arrangement allowed them to utilize Hershey chocolate for the confectionery. Together, they produced several foodstuffs such as the Uncle Ben's Rice, Pedigree Dog Food, and M&M's, Mars and Murray. Despite production having to initially sell exclusively to military due to the war effort, M&M's were quickly a resounding success. By 1956, they were America's number one candy. Around this time, Murray had grown weary of the company. Mars purchased Murray's 20% for a million dollars, a small amount compared to the candy's revenue. Forrest Mars then folded the company into the greater Mars Candy Company. Murray was unable to return to Hershey for the part he played in Mars's rise and passed into obscurity. M&M's then passed the years mostly without incident until the 1970s. Red number two, or amaranth, was one of the 20th century's most popular food dyes. By the 1970s, it could be found in nearly $10 billion worth of products. Its popularity was exactly the problem when, in 1971, researchers in the Soviet Union linked the dye to cancer. This ignited a mild fury, since it played into popular concern over the safety of dyes that had been around since a series of suspicious poisonings in 1950. While the FDA did not find definite results that Red 2 was linked to cancer, they decided that it was not necessary enough to risk it, and Red 2 was subsequently banned. And with Red 2 went the Red M&Ms. Interesting thing is though, M&Ms never used Red 2. They used Red 40. Mars canceled the color simply to assuage public concern. In 1980, the University of Tennessee student Paul Hithman decided he wanted the candies back. While it started as a sort of joke amongst his friends, it quickly grew into an actual national campaign. Eventually, word reached Hans Fusinski. Ha Hans Fusinski. Fusinski. Director of Mars Corporation's External Relations. Fusinski brought the good news in 1987 that the Red M&Ms were coming back. Not only are the Red M&Ms back, but Mars has since used the Red M&M as their logo and their main mascot, voiced by voice legend Billy West. On a completely unrelated note, tan M&Ms were discontinued in 1995 to make room for blue M&Ms. Dear mother of God, <laughs> this can't continue. What's wrong, man? Would you look? Red, yellow, brown, green. That's the way I understood it to be. But now, blue. <laughs> Has the world gone mad? <laughs> Dejas M&M, see?